The inaugural issue of the New Thinking Aloud magazine was just released on March 1st. You can download a free PDF copy from the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website. That's newthinkingaloud.org. You can even order a printed copy from mta-magazine.magcloud.com. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring reincarnation and possession. With me is anthropologist Dr. James Matlock, who is the co-author with Erlander Haraldson of a recently published book called I Saw a Light and Came Here, Children's Experiences of Reincarnation. He is also a regular contributor to the online Psy Encyclopedia, sponsored by the Society for Psychical Research in London and he has created a course, an academic course on reincarnation called Signs of Reincarnation. It's, to my knowledge, the only academic course focusing exclusively on reincarnation. Welcome, Jim. Good to be here, Jeff. Pleasure to be with you. Uh, now, to begin with, I know many of our viewers are going to have preconceived ideas about what we mean by possession, mm. Uh, mm. especially because the the popular movies and uh, are, are full of cases of what I would call hostile possession. But mm. we're really not looking at that so much. So l let's define possession as we're going to use it in this interview. Okay. Yes, and uh, parapsychologists tend to call cases like that demonic possession. Yeah. I, I think, yes, you're right. I mean, for many people, possession is sort of equated with demonic possession, and it's not at all clear what that might have to do with reincarnation. Uh, uh, parapsychologists tend to think of possession slightly differently. I uh, think of mediumistic possession, say, where a uh, a spirit, a communicating spirit, takes possession of the medium and mm -hmm. trans mediumship. Yep. Uh, or there are uh, there there are cases. One famous case of Lorenzi Venom, say, mm -hmm. which is a oh, classic case. A classic case. Classic a great case one to get into. A classic case of possession, uh, where uh, a girl, teenager. Uh, Laurence Venom, uh, I, I, again, to have uh, uh, certain problems that she wanted to resolve. In the town of Watsika, Illinois. Uh, Watsika, Illinois, that's right. Yeah. Uh, south, of, south of Chicago. South of Chicago. Uh, I, and uh, I was uh, and voluntarily left, mm -hmm. and uh, her personality was displaced by a different personality, th that of Mary Roth, a child who had died in the same it, it town. Died in the same and was years early, earlier, uh, as I recall. Uh, yes, I, I haven't reviewed the case either. Very I think recently, it's like ten years it earlier. Earlier, and it was only casually known to her family. It was known mm -hmm. to her family, as I recall, right. but not very well known. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she took over and said that uh, she had taken taken over uh, Laurence's body to allow Laurence to get better. Mm -hmm. And she remained in possession for 13 weeks. Yeah. As I recall this case, uh, Mary Roth, the possessing spirit, had suffered a similar illness before she died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she remained in possession for 13 weeks only. Yeah. Went to live then, with her pr pr And she her went to, yes, family. this is important, actually. Yes, yes. Yes, and it, you know this is typical of possession cases. She didn't identify herself as Laurenti anymore. She identified herself as Mary. Didn't recognize Laurenti's parents. Wanted to live with Mary's family. Went to live with Mary's family. And they accepted. And her. And they accepted her because she recognized all Mary's family and friends and possessions and so forth. And for all effects and purposes, was Mary. Yeah. 
in Laurency's body. Yeah. Uh, but then after 13 weeks, Mary left and Laurency returned. And as I recall, she said, okay, I'm, I'm going to be going now. She announced. That's right. Yes. I mean, and there you know, was and announcing so, dreams as, as well, to my recollection. Involved in this. Yeah. So it's a very curious case mm -hmm. that has <clears throat> overlaps and resemblances to the reincarnation cases in various, in various ways, particularly uh, through the dreams and through the behavioral identification, the identification through memories, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the self identification, uh, the, the first person. It's uh, sort of the archetypal person. parapsychological case of possession. Of possession. Now, but I know you're an anthropologist, and anthropologists also use the term possession from time to time. They do. Uh, because they're describing indigenous cultures, mm -hmm. tribal cultures, in which possession uh, of the mediumistic sort uh, can be very common. And typically, uh, as I recall, shamans will mm -hmm. become entranced and possessed not by deceased individuals, but maybe by deities. Or yes, or their uh, controlled spirits, as it were, as yeah. we might call them. And, the and they they may go into a dance. A, Right. For example. Right. So this is sort of classical possession, mm -hmm. you know, outside of reincarnation context, right. with overlaps and parallels to what we see in the reincarnation cases. Yes. And yet, uh, as with, uh, as in uh, mediumistic possession, it's very short term, mm -hmm. or shamanic possession, very short term, or in the Laurency Venom case, 13 weeks, but still yeah. limited. Limited. Uh, and then we come to cases of uh, of reincarnation that are that are more limited, but to come back to the definition of possession, yeah, in the types of possession that we've been talking about, the possession involves the displacement of one spirit by another spirit, right? Uh, and for many people, that's what they think of when they think of possession. Mm -hmm. They think of the by, of, of the. the of, of the spirit of Jim being displaced by uh, the spirit of um, of uh, Jim's deceased grandfather or something, mm -hmm. or of uh, or the, the, the some demonic uh, yeah. spirit taking over <laughs> Jim's body. Uh, but that's not the only way we can think of possession, and that's the only way not the only way to define it. We can think of possession simply as the possession of a body. Right, which is what the word literally means. means. Yes, uh huh, uh, and without the connotation or the implication of replacement, mm -hmm. and in that case, we can think of all reincarnation as possession. Mm -hmm. Right, it's just a possession that occurs early during the or sometime during the period of gestation. At any rate, before birth. Mm -hmm. So, if we think of it that way. All reincarnation is possession of a permanent sort. Of a permanent sort, and yes, not exactly. necessarily displacing any other spiritual entity. Precisely. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> and this is what <clears throat> you know, the main topic of today is yeah. right. Is those cases, and there are these cases that are like Lorenzi's case, in that there's a, uh, a replacement of some duration. Mm -hmm. However, it's of longer duration. And in, uh, in two cases that we know about, uh, that we're able to follow to the ends of the lives, lasted to the end of the natural life mm -hmm. of the person. Mm -hmm. And my term for these is replacement reincarnation. Replacement reincarnation. reincarnation. Uh, there are other terms that have been used for it, and it's a uh, 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 Stevenson liked to call them anomalous date cases uh -huh. because the date of the death of the uh, the replacing spirit or the possessing spirit was later than the birth date mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, of the person. So you're uh, assuming that therefore once once you're born there must be some sort of a spiritual entity in possession that gets replaced. I'm assuming that uh, that uh, that that the um, that the subject of the case is born with one spirit in control of its body, yes. and then at a later juncture, uh, a different spirit comes in 
and replaces the spirit that was originally in control of the body and takes control of the yes. body and persists in control of the body right. to the end of the natural life. Right. Now, uh, one, there are a number of interesting characteristics of these cases. One is that typically uh, they are associated with illness. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, uh, and uh, it's often a severe illness. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the person actually seems to die mm -hmm. and then revives with a different personality. Uh -huh. Okay, as if the old spirit left actually and the new spirit has taken yeah. possession. Yeah. Uh, they also tend to happen when the the uh, the subject of the case is young mm -hmm. you know maybe only a few days a few weeks a few months mm -hmm. old uh, in other cases like this uh, and it, when they're that young they really can't say anything they have mm -hmm. memories of uh, you know of <laughs> Of uh, they can't speak of you know yeah. uh, of the memories. Sometimes when they become older, they do have memories, but not of their first years mm -hmm. or first months, mm -hmm. but of the previous life. Uh -huh. uh, you know of the person. Uh, in, in other words, so the replacing spirit then grows a little older and begins to speak and has memories of having been another person who died after the uh, present body was born. Right. Well, the body is what becomes older. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the, the uh, uh, we could, there are cases where the, um, uh, uh, where the, the subject of the case is a little bit older. Mm -hmm. uh, around three, there are several cases around three. There are also some when they were teenagers. Yeah, okay. Okay. So by age three, the the personality is well enough developed and obviously mm -hmm. they is able to speak and yeah. so forth and um, so in these cases when replacement occurs after age three the new spirit coming in doesn't take it doesn't have to have any time to adjust uh, 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 to uh, you know, it doesn't need to. Be, it, it immediately begins to claim to be another person, oh. the deceased person. Uh -huh. It calls itself by the deceased person's name, mm -hmm. uh, acts like the deceased person, mm -hmm. uh, recognizes things it, exactly okay. like Mary Roth, mm -hmm. except that here we're talking about uh, you know a spirit, a lifelong possession, a lifelong possession. Yeah, and but here we're talking, yeah, and typically about. Uh, and in all cases of uh, this, I believe, of uh, of, uh, of a spirit that was not known mm -hmm. to the uh, to the the subject's family. Okay. Now, in the New Age literature, uh, I believe uh, Ruth Montgomery, well-known mm -hmm. spiritualist and psychic. I'm not sure if she was a medium as well, but uh, she talked about walk-ins, walk and that became a very popular term in New right. Age parlance. It seems to resemble this kind of uh, replacement reincarnation. It does, and that's still the popular term, mm -hmm. but there's a difference. The way mm -hmm. Montgomery described walk-ins, they were advanced entities coming in uh, to uh, help out the person or mm -hmm. to help out humanity yeah. by, you know, uh, by bringing it's it's a more advanced knowledge mm -hmm. to to the to the world, and that's not what we see in these cases. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I prefer not to call them walk-ins and to avoid that connotation. Sure. Uh, but for me, I, it, 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 as far as we know, uh, this is a phenomenon that has always occurred. Uh, there is, a, in fact, a, a Hindi term, a Sanskrit term for mm -hmm. it, yes. called Parakara Parakaya Pravesh. Which means literally uh, a wandering spirit mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, walk, uh, taking possession of a of a body, mm -hmm. uh, which describes exactly this, uh, and it's the term that's still used in India mm -hmm. to describe cases like this. Uh -huh. uh, and of course, Sanskrit has been an extinct language for quite a long time now. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're talking about a phenomenon then that was known for thousands for of thousands years. of years. Yeah. You know. Um, and we have um, documentation of it mm -hmm. uh, from uh, from many centuries, 
You know, so it's not uh, mm -hmm. it's not a, a current thing. As bizarre as it sounds, yeah. uh, it, it seems to be something that can actually happen. Uh, and we also have uh, cases like this documented from all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, from Asian and Western societies. Right. Well, does this in any way seem hostile to you? I mean, the illness and so on? Is by and large, no. Mm -hmm. By and large, no. I have to say no. I, you know, we, it's hard to, um, to say definitely or definitively, but it, it, it would seem, because of the association with illness, mm -hmm. it does seem as if there would be a natural exit point for one spirit mm -hmm. and for the entry point for another spirit and then of course they revive oftentimes they're thought to be dead mm -hmm. uh, the death uh, they're prepared for burial or mm -hmm. cremation or something and then they revive mm -hmm. uh, there are three cases though where uh, in last uh, time we talked uh, we talked about intermission memories yes there are three cases like this in which there were intermission memories uh -huh. and so intermission memories are the memories of the interval between death and rebirth yes so that is memories of what happened mm -hmm. uh, after they died and how they came mm -hmm. to possess the new body well that would be fascinating and in none of those three cases do they talk about uh, having forcibly uh, removed how do they describe it in different ways in all three mm -hmm. in one of them and this is a case described by Ian Stevenson in his classic book 20 cases suggestive yes. of reincarnation the case of just beer uh, he uh, was, uh, Jess Beer took sick uh, and seemed to die, then revived, claiming to be another person entirely, mm -hmm. Soparam, yep. who said that he had died during a wedding procession between villages. Mm -hmm. He had fallen <laughs> off a chariot after having been given uh, uh, what he thought was poisoned candy, poisoned sweets, oh. by uh, someone. He thought he had been poisoned, and that's yes. what caused him to fall off. Mm -hmm. Well, he said after that that he was met uh, by a holy man mm -hmm. who escorted him. And if you, uh, uh, if you recall from from what we talked about last time, yeah. uh, there's often an assistant, the guide, the guide, mm -hmm. or an assistant uh, to the the. Um, to the rebirth also, mm -hmm. a guide and then an mm -hmm. assisted rebirth. And that's what happened in this case. So the holy the man Sandu, said, well, here's... The, the holy man, right, and said, come with me, and took him along, and then showed him just uh -huh. Beer's body. Oh, I see. And led him to it. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, there's a, a Hungarian case mm -hmm. uh, where uh, th there was, uh, I, again, uh, a replacement, mm -hmm. this time of a teenager, uh, uh, not with illness, but actually during a mediumistic seance, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, who t took over the body, but said that uh, the last thing that she remembered, uh, uh, she was floating happily in space, she was quite happily to have died, mm -hmm. and then she didn't know what had happened, but all of a sudden she woke up in this new body, I younger see. body, uh -huh. and she was happy to be in the younger body, yeah. But she had no, but she had no, no idea I, of how she got there. Uh -huh. um, and but once in that body, again, uh, identified herself as the previous person, mm -hmm. acted like that person. Uh, the subject of the case began to have new skills, cooking skills, dancing skills. Mm -hmm. You know, she said that she was uh, uh, a charwoman from Madrid, and mm -hmm. you know, she acted the part. So this must be stressful for the family to have your child get sick and then all of a sudden uh, it, it act as if it, it's another person. Yes, it must be. <laughs> you know, one can hardly begin to imagine what it must be like to the family. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, do the researchers report about this? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. uh, they do. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, in one case, one of the best described of cases of this sort. Uh, Sumitra Singh uh, actually occurred when uh, Sumitra was uh, already married. Mm -hmm. uh, she was st uh, still young, still yeah. a teenager, but she was already married mm -hmm. and uh, had children mm -hmm. and uh, appeared to die. And the uh, another spirit then came in, uh, somebody recently deceased. In all of these cases also, uh, the 
the possessing spirit, the replacing reincarnation possessing spirit, had died only very recently. So the interval is quite short. The interval short. is quite short. Mm -hmm. And uh, the death was, in all these cases, definitely after the birth mm -hmm. of the... Uh, of the case subject. And, and in this case, Samucha, as you say, was a teenager already. He was a teenager already, already. already. Yeah. yes. Yeah. So it was very definitely um, older. Uh, and uh, uh, she uh, she didn't know her husband, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, didn't recognize her child. Yeah. She later came to accept, mm -hmm. still insisting that she was not Sumitra, that she was Shiva. Mm -hmm. She later came to accept her husband yeah. and accept her child, but she really wasn't happy. And I actually left the town and, and went, to, uh, I believe it was to Delhi. Because there, there could be issues of social class and things of that sort of. And typically there are in these cases. Yeah. Uh, and there were in this case. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the interesting features of this case is that Sumitra could not well could not write well. Mm -hmm. uh, she was her penmanship was very poor and was basically illiterate. Uh, whereas Shiva was much better educated. Mm -hmm. He wrote very well. Had written you know letters and postcards, mm -hmm. and she continued to do that after she took over. Now her penmanship was not quite up to the level of Shiva's of the past life, mm -hmm. but it was much improved over Sumitra's. You know, they were able to identify the past life and actually compare mm -hmm. penmanship. Yes, yes. yes. Now yes. I mean that's a whole other interesting angle here, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, so, uh, in, in, in all these cases, except for the last one I mentioned, the Hungarian case, uh, the previous person wasn't, wasn't identified there. Mm -hmm. That's an unsolved case. All the rest of them are solved. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of what the children, not the children or adults, or what the, the case subjects say after the possession, after the replacement mm -hmm. takes place, you know, uh, they say enough, they give enough names. They remember enough mm -hmm. of the previous life yeah. that that person can be traced and identified. Which is, uh, for benefit of viewers who haven't watched our previous interviews, that's what you mean by a solved case. That's what I mean by a solved case. Yeah, and uh, you know, and so in in all respects, except for. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the replacement aspect of yeah. it, they look exactly like mm -hmm. other reincarnation cases that we've studied. In other words, for you, reincarnation itself is a form of a possession. possession. Right, exactly. And I think that's the, uh, that, the, 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 as I think of it, uh, that's what makes the most sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, and people ask naturally, <clears throat> well, does that mean that in these replacement cases they're replacing another soul in the body? Well, yes, it does seem that way, mm -hmm. but because of the illness, yeah. it doesn't seem like they're necessarily forcibly displacing it. Uh -huh. Well, I I'm guessing that at this point in time we don't have cases where a person remembers a past lifetime in which they were replaced. We never hear from the other no, spirits uh, no. so far, and we don't. No, so far, we have not, and we haven't. Uh, uh, and they might not know that they were replaced. Mm -hmm. They might not just think that they had died early. Yeah. Okay. So they may remember a previous life, mm -hmm. but not even be aware of the fact that after they thought they had died, their body was taken mm -hmm. over by another spirit yeah. and continued on. Continued well, I can live. imagine for what it's worth that 50 or 100 years from now, if people are watching this video, they may have a much larger database to draw upon right. and could begin to uh, make more uh, finely tuned inferences based on the, the data that will be available in the future. You know, and these case, because our data really are limited now, you yeah. know, and we can only generalize so far from them. We can make predictions, though, mm -hmm. you know, and see if those predictions are borne out by data that's collected later. Now, well, with and regard these, to possession, have you made predictions? Uh, no, not any precise ones. Uh, but, I mean, we can generalize from the things that I've said, yeah. you know, uh, and, uh, and make, uh, generaliz and those generalizations in a sense can become, you know, predictions. Do you, well, do you have a, a, an example? 
Uh, well, well, you're, putting me, you're putting me on the spot now, uh, Jeff, <laughs> because I haven't thought about this. I haven't thought yeah. it through, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know what my answer would oh, be exactly. All right. uh, but I guess, you know, uh, certainly in these cases, um, I mean, one can say that uh, one can take the fact that they're generally associated with uh, with illness mm -hmm. uh, to say that that is an aspect, that is something that one would expect to so find. So you could say if in, in the future, if we can get a statistically well, large enough number of such cases, cases. We would expect. Now, it's not that you always find the illness, but you generally do. Yeah. So you can say that that is something we would look for in these cases mm -hmm. that, you know, and if we continue to see it, it becomes, uh, uh, you know, it becomes part of the syndrome. Right, it becomes part of the. We can we can then definitely say it's part of the syndrome. Now we can hypothesize that it is, mm -hmm. and we can confirm that hypothesis through the study of cases that are collected later. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's one case that you've referred to in the literature, not necessarily the parapsychological literature, but observed by a Westerner of a, a case, as I recall, in Tibet, in which it seemed as if a, a form of possession of the kind we're discussing was deliberately inculcated <laughs> yes. through some sort of ritual practice. Yes, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the most crazy uh, cases in, in, in a phenomenon that's already pretty wild. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I, and it's a practice that actually uh, apparently goes back uh, some time in Tibet of uh, of uh, uh, either a political leader or a religious leader uh, intentionally uh, becoming reincarnated by replacing uh, uh, the the spirit of uh, you know in a body uh, already living. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, the one that was observed by the Frenchman, uh, there was the, uh, a young boy was chosen, it's said, by uh, by the help of astrologers and, uh, and mm. magicians. I see. It was said uh, to be the correct uh, vehicle. The for recipient. The recipient yeah. of uh, the, the, the correct body for the new incarnation mm -hmm. of this Lama. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the Lama, uh, the boy was placed on a bier beside the embalmed body of the Lama. Uh, embalming were, is a little unusual in Tibet. Uh, I, I, at any rate, yeah. the, the the case describes it as is as, as an embalmed body. Right. So I don't, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, a replace uh, placed on the bier uh, at the knees of the body. Uh, both were covered with uh, a sheet, mm -hmm. and uh, the boy was heard to utter a cry, uh, and then uh, rose up, got up. Uh, uh, claiming to be the Lama, mm -hmm. uh, appeared to uh, recognize, uh, you know, appeared to all, in all aspects to be the Lama and not and the boy anymore. He was tested. He was te well, the he was then tested. I mean, so the personality, you know, uh -huh. he had the personality of the Lama. By, he seemed to be the Lama. And he was then tested in the way that incarnations are tested in Tibet by seeing if he could pick out, mm -hmm. you know, the correct possessions, and he did. I, the test. I see. And what presumably happened at that point to the spirit of the boy? Well, n nothing is said about that. And as we said earlier, uh, we don't really have much information mm -hmm. on what happens to the spirit that's been replaced. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly does suggest that uh, there, there's something to be learned here by studying the Tibetan traditions further. Well, yes, it does. Mm -hmm. yeah. It really does. Um, I do know that um, there's one potential case that might signify an example of a hostile possession. Mm. That, uh, uh, yes, and, and not only that, uh, you know, and it's um, I, it's also an example of what we can call prenatal mm -hmm. uh, reincarnation, replacement reincarnation. That is, that it occurred if, if it's if my interpretation of this case is correct, uh, it occurred uh, when the uh, the mother when the, uh, the mother was six months along in mm -hmm. her pregnancy. Yes. So at the end of the second trimester, the beginning of the third, uh, when she interestingly became very sick. Uh, she suddenly became sick at the mm -hmm. beginning of her third trimester, had not been sick up until that point. Yeah. Um, 
the the father of the the boy the the boy who remembered uh the life mm-hmm. of the uh uh of the uh previous uh, person the previous person the one who m- may have replaced uh, uh a spirit who had been in the body up mm-hmm. to that point uh thought the the boy had been born mm-hmm. uh at uh, three, uh, uh, th- uh, at, a, at a certain date, mm-hmm. uh, there's no birth certificate in this case, unfortunately. Yeah. So we don't have a firm, definitely t- definite birth date. But the father's memory of his birth placed it three months before the death mm-hmm. of the person uh, that the the case subject mm-hmm. later began to talk about. Right. Right. And uh, he said enough, to, is typical of these cases, for uh, for that person to be identified. A, a past life identification. In other words, right. a, a solved case. A, it became a solved case. Mm-hmm. And uh, when the investigator, Antonio Mills in this case, the boy was born with birthmarks. Mm-hmm. We've talked about birthmarks before. Yes, we've done a in whole another, interview in, on, in, on uh, birthmarks and the physical signs of... Uh, of reincarnation. Yeah. So, uh, so birthmarks are common in these cases. Cases. Yes. Uh, well, the case subject of this uh, this particular case, Titu Singh, was born with a number of birthmarks, mm-hmm. uh, with a series of birthmarks on the uh, on the the back of his neck, and uh, one on his forehead, and then another right behind his ear, mm-hmm. uh, which is actually a birth minor birth defect right mm-hmm. behind the ear. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and the family had assumed that these birthmarks were related to the previous person. Yes. Uh, but with an, when Antonia Mills began to investigate the case, she went back and got hold of the uh, the autopsy report mm-hmm. of the previous person, which right. showed the location of the death wounds. Mm-hmm. It turned out that he had been uh, something of a gangster. Yes. Uh, and had been uh, killed, murdered by another gang member, by a member of a rival gang, mm-hmm. who had shot himself, who had shot himself, who had shot him in the head. Yes. Uh, and uh, at the location of one of the birthmarks mm-hmm. that Tito had, uh, and the bullet had exited behind his ear. Now, the birth family, the mother, parents had not noticed the birthmark behind the ear. Mm. But when um, Tony and Mills noticed this, she went back to Titu, looked behind his ear, yeah. and sure enough, there was a bony protrusion there, mm. right behind the ear, behind yeah. the ear lobe, uh-huh. uh, that would mark the exit wound for the bullet. Right. I mean, this is what we see in many cases mm-hmm. of bullet, uh, of uh, birthmarks related to a bullet, of yeah. gunshots. Mm-hmm. There's an e- entry and exit wound. Yeah. If that if those were the entry and exit wounds, that left the other birthmarks on Tito unexplained. Mm-hmm. Now, Which led you to hypothesize uh, there might have been another spirit, spirit in, in the body that was or replaced. in the fetus. That's right. Uh-huh. Now, if we accept the, the father's mm-hmm. birth date that yeah. he gave for, for Tito, yeah. then then Tito took, must have taken possession of the body, uh, and we know that right. the, we know the time of the death uh-huh. of of the previous person. Sure, and that was around the, that time, yeah. exactly that time. And the mother was getting ill at that getting time Ill at as exactly well. Exactly that time. So the times line up very well. So that's well. about as close as you can find in the actual case history literature of reincarnation that even remotely resembles a hostile a possession. hostile takeover, right? Yeah, uh, but it, dep- it does depend on accepting the father's uh, memory of the boy's of Tito's birthday because yeah. we don't have a, a birth record of it right and, and and probably a few other assumptions as as well so right but again I mean if we want to we can take this case yeah. and take these assumptions mm-hmm. make them as hypotheses and then uh, and then see if Later cases mm-hmm. uh, uh, that are better supported yeah. uh, match up, mm-hmm. uh, and then if they do, you know that would confirm the predictions that we make on the basis. Well, of this case. I hope that people are viewing this video fifty, a hundred years from <laughs> now, and that they can say, "Yes, Jim, we've done that." <laughs> 
Well, I hope so too. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Jim Matlock, once again, a fascinating discussion. Well, thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate it. I appreciate being here and I'm very happy to and glad to be about with it. you as as well. Thank you for being with me and yeah. thank you for being with us. Thank you.